This conference will now be recorded. Okay, well, this is a, a pleasure to get to, to speak to everyone today. Um, so my name is Deanna Apps. Um, I work out of the Hydraulics and Hydrology Office in the Detroit District. Um, and today I'll, I'll go through this presentation I put together um, on Great Lakes water levels. I'll kind of go over some introductory topics in the beginning of, um, you know, about water levels, what are the factors that influence water levels, um, and then I'll talk about uh, our main forecast product for water levels is our six-month forecast. So I'll spend some time to go through that. Um, so to start here, um, I just like to start off with some few a few pictures uh, from high water photos that we've seen across the Great Lakes Basin, and um, a lot of these uh, photos were from either the the spring or fall of 2019. Um, you can see this top left picture um, is from Canal Park near Duluth, Minnesota, on the shore of Lake Superior. You can see flooding uh, that is occurring that was occurring in the park. This was back in October, I believe. Um, again, another this is another picture. This is from South Haven, Michigan, here in your top right. Um, you can see debris washing up on shore, becoming very close to these condominiums. Um, again, with another October uh, fall event that occurred on the lakes. Uh, this bottom left picture is from Stony Point, Michigan, on the shore of Lake Erie. Um, you can see uh, water overtopping the seawalls and affecting this community here. This was um, during the spring of last year. And then finally, this picture on the bottom right from the Lake Ontario from the spring of last year. Uh, in Oswego, New York, you can see uh, high waves and flooding occurring along the road um, in, in this. So the impacts of high water have really been felt across the basin over the last year or two. So I know this slide actually has a lot of text on it, um, but these are just a few things I want to go over, and I'll, pro I'll probably touch on uh, all these bullets separately with graphics in the coming slides. So the first thing I want to point out there is on um, the first bullet is that water levels are measured as an elevation above sea level, not as a depth. So they're measured as a height, uh, and that's an elevation above sea level in reference to the International Great Lakes Datum of 1985. Uh, which has its zero reference point near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, as you hear me go through this presentation, you'll hear me reference Lake Michigan Huron as one lake. Um, because they're connected at the Straits of Mackinac, uh, they rise and fall together as one lake. So from a, a hydrologic uh, standpoint, we consider them one lake for our forecasting and reporting water levels. Uh, on our webpage, you can access daily lake-wide average water levels. We have water level reports that show the, you know, updated to through yesterday of the daily lake-wide average levels. And then at the end of the month, uh, we take those daily lake-wide average water levels and we compute a monthly average water level or a monthly mean. And the monthly mean water levels are really the main uh, water level statistic that we report out at the core. Um, to calculate these daily lake-wide average water levels, we use a network of water level gauges, which again, I will talk about here again in a couple slides. Um, and we do this, we use multiple gauges in determining what that average water level is. So we're essentially getting a water level based on still water. And we're, um, and we're not accounting for influences that may be occurring at a specific location based on meteorological forcing. So we try to average those influences out uh, that could be occurring maybe due to wind at a specific location. Um, at the Detroit district, um, we are the keeper of official monthly water level statistics from 1918 to 2018. So our period of record of water levels goes back uh, over 100 years. To 1918. We coordinate this data set with our counter, our counterparts on the other side of the border in Environment and Climate Change Canada. We coordinate uh, water level data as well as our six-month forecast, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, and lastly, the last point I want to make, as you'll hear me touch on throughout this presentation, is that the primary drivers of water level fluctuations are changing weather patterns and that resulting fluctuation in water supply. So the, the other thing I like to start off here with is uh, really diagrams that are in show really how large this Great Lakes uh, system is. 
And the diagram you're seeing on the right here, uh, this is an image uh, showing the Great Lakes Basin and everything highlighted in this green area um, and including the lakes is considered the Great Lakes Basin. Um, you can see that it's very a very interconnected system and it's very large. Um, every you know drop of water that falls within this basin um, impacts water levels throughout the system and um, it's a it's very interconnected and this diagram here on the left shows a side profile view of how water flows through this system so if you're beginning in lake superior water flows through the saint mary's river into lakes michigan and huron through the saint Clair river into lake saint Clair, through the detroit river into lake erie through the niagara river over the niagara falls into lake ontario and then eventually out through the St. Lawrence River and the water makes its way to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so that's how water moves through the system. I do wanna take time to note on this slide that there are two places in the system where outflows are regulated. Uh, the first being through the St. Mary's River from Lake Superior into Lake Michigan, Huron, and out of Lake Ontario through the St. Lawrence River. Uh, regulation of these outflows is a responsibility of the International Lake Superior Board of Control and the International Lake Ontario uh, St. Lawrence River Board of Control. And that's run through the, under the authority of the International Joint Commission. Uh, I wanna stress that the regulation of outflows cannot prevent extreme high or low water levels, nor can it fully control water levels. Water levels, again, are mainly driven by weather and mother nature. So as I mentioned in that note slide, we do monitor the Great Lakes using a network of water level gauges. Um, so this is uh, the network throughout the Great Lakes Basin. You can see the blue dots um, are all gauges that are run on the US side of the border, and they're run by NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, every dot that is green is run on the Canadian side of the border, and they are, uh, they are done by the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, each of the bolded dots that you see, so um, you know the the dots that are have are bolded, represent that daily lake wide average network. Uh, you can see that I've highlighted here down below for each of the lakes um, what uh, gauges are used in their respective calculations. You can see that the number of gauges used differs uh, from lake to lake. But the idea is to get um, you know, a distribution of gauges around the lake to really give us a representation of what that water level is on average across the lake. So next I'm gonna kind of transition and talking about what are the factors that impact water levels? Um, and the first thing you, you'll notice likely is this red circle that's called net basin supply. And these, this net basin supply is one of the main uh, things we're tracking at the core. And net basin supply is made up of precipitation that falls uh, uh, over the lake, runoff that occurs to the lake, and evaporation off of the lake surface. Now, we also have to account for inflows from the upstream lake. So for example, for Lake Michigan Huron, we would have to account for the inflow through the St. Mary's River that goes into Lake Michigan Huron. Also, we have to account for the outflow out of Lake Michigan Huron, for example, and that would be through the St. Clair River. So how does this look on over the, over the course of a year? What happens to water levels um, over the course of a year based on the types of weather conditions and hydrologic conditions that we're seeing. So you'll notice here this red line is a representation of example of a annual water level cycle we would see uh, on one of the lakes. Um, and what you'll see is during the winter time when we're starting to, you know, when we have that snow accumulation, typically the ground is frozen during that time that's typically when we see a seasonal low in water levels. Now, as we get into the springtime and the snow starts melting, 
and that increases the runoff to the, in the basin. And we get that increased precipitation from, um, you know, usually increased rainfall as temperatures warm up. We start to see water levels rise. And water levels typically rise uh, into the, you know, early to mid summer um, until they reach their seasonal peak. And once they reach their peak in the summer, the main thing that's going on is really the sunshine is really helping to warm the lake surface water. And that becomes very important as we head into the fall months. Because as you head into the fall and early winter, water level decline occurs. And it occurs mainly due to evaporation that is occurring off of the lake. And evaporation occurs typically during this time of year because we start to have that colder air entering the region. So, you know, as we get these cold air outbreaks in the fall and early winter, and you, that colder air is moving over that relatively warm lake surface water, that really is what induces evaporation. That larger the temperature difference between the air and the water, uh, can, can lead to significant evaporation during that time and is really the primary driver of water level decline during that time of year. So if we look at our full period of record of water level data that goes back to 1918, you can see that annual cycle we just talked about. What you're looking at here is uh, hydrographs for each of the lakes. So you can see Lake Superior here at the top, Lake Michigan, Huron, St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. The blue line is the monthly mean water level for each of the lakes, again, dating back to 1918 through 2020. That red line you're seeing is the long-term average annual level for that respective lake. And what you can really notice from, uh, from these plots is you can, identify periods of high and low water that have occurred across the Great Lakes. Uh, for example, uh, we can see a higher water period here in the, in the late 20s and into the early 30s. We can see another high water period here in the early 50s, um, a low water period here in the early to mid 60s. Um, a lot of people remember the high water period of the mid 80s. Um, that was really one of the, the last times we've seen water almost as high as it is now on, on some of these upper lakes. Um, and then you'll notice um, in the late 90s, uh, we really drop into this period of low water, uh, especially on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron, but you can also notice it uh, on St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario as well. Um, this decade plus of low water uh, really extended into uh, 2013. Uh, and Lake Michigan Huron had a record low monthly mean water level in January of 2013. Now, after that, that was preceded, uh, preceded by a few years of record high, a record rise in water levels um, that brought water levels back above average. And then really over the last few years, on an annual basis, water levels have continued to rise and have led to the record high water levels of 2019 and 2020. So if we look at what has occurred over the last year, um, this is Great Lakes monthly mean water levels. These are the records that were set last year in 2019 and so far in 2020. Um, so from beginning in May of last year in 2019, we started to set records on Lake Superior, St. Clair, and Lake Erie. Records continued on those three lakes through September of 2019. Um, you can also see that Lake Ontario joined um, the record breaking in June and July of last year. Um, and you can also notice that there are asterisks next to Lake Erie and Ontario in June in Lake St. Clair in July. Uh, those are there because not only were they the uh, highest on record for those respective months, they're also now our highest monthly mean on record for all months in our period of record that dates back to 1918. We finished 2019, the last three months, um, with no records, uh, but that changed as we went into 2020. 
Um, in January of 2020, we started to see records on Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, and St. Clair. So Michigan Huron has now also uh, joined the record breaking here in 2020 since it did not set a record in 2019. And it has set a record uh, the first five months so far of the year, uh, as well as uh, Lake St. Clair and Erie have also continued to set records as well. So the next question likely becomes, well, why are levels so high? How did we get here? Um, and a lot of that has to do with a very persistent wet pattern uh, we've seen in the region over the last several years. Uh, what this graphic is showing is it's showing annual precipitation in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, this is data that's only on the US side of the border because it's uh, put together by NOAA. Um, but as you can see here, there's a line that goes across this gray line, and that represents the the mean uh, from 1901 to 2000. Um, so that's the annual average precipitation um, for the Great Lakes Basin during that time. And what you can notice, if you if we look in these re these few recent years that have occurred, you can see really since 2013, which is this dot right here. Um, that we've seen uh, above average precipitation in the basin. And that's really continued uh, over the last uh, several years. And then if you look at the last three years, which I've highlighted in this purple box, 2017, 18, and 19, you can see that we've had exceptionally wet years um, over the last three years, which has really impacted water levels and has really culminated in the record high water levels that we've seen in, in 2019 and uh, so far in 2020. I also wanted to take a few minutes here uh, to talk about some of the recent conditions. Okay, so, you know, we kind of know that we've seen this wet pattern through 2019, but how is 2020 looking? Uh, compared to other years. So I've highlighted here a couple graphics that uh, talk about the spring conditions we've seen in the basin. Um, this first graphic here on the left is percent of normal precipitation uh, from the beginning of March through the end of May. So the spring months, March, April, and May. Um, and you can, what you can see, anything colored in that greenish blue color really means precipitation has been above average in this area or above normal. Anything in this yellow or orange-ish color means precipitation has been below normal. And what you can see this spring as we've really seen drier conditions on the eastern side of the basin. So in the Lake Ontario Basin, for example, conditions have been fairly dry. However, if we look in Michigan, uh, the lower peninsula of Michigan, you can see that conditions have been have been fairly wet, uh, especially due to a, a lot of people in Michigan probably remember that that mid-May event that brought several inches of rain to to some of these communities and um, you know really had some significant impacts. Uh, but you can also see even in the northern Lake Superior uh, Basin, conditions have been drier this spring. Now, this, this graphic here on the right is a similar graphic, but just um, showing temperature over this time. Um, this light yellowish color means that temperatures have been uh, just slightly about a degree Fahrenheit above normal on the eastern side of the basin. And this lightish blue color is representing temperatures have been slightly below normal, about one degree Fahrenheit below normal. And so you're probably thinking, okay, well, yeah, temperatures have been been fairly near normal. However, if you look at each month individually, um, you can see that March was much warmer than normal, where April and May were actually cooler than normal. And so that's really what's causing that overall spring mean temperature to be near normal, almost a balancing out of very warm conditions to start the spring and fairly cooler conditions to end the springtime. So next, I'm going to talk now talk about our main product, which is the six-month water level forecast product. Um, this is a product we produce at the beginning of every month. It goes out six months. So our current forecast was done at the beginning of June, and it goes through November 2020. Um, you can access this site on our on our access this on our website, um, which I've included the link here below. 
Um, and these graphics are what you what you will find on our website. So I want to take some time. Um, we're going to start here with Lake Superior, um, and, and I have a slide for each of the lakes, but I want to spend some time going over how to actually interpret or read this graphic. Um, so first, I want to draw your attention to um, this zero line. The zero line that goes across the chart is a reference level, which we call chart datum, and is representative of 601.1 feet for Lake Superior. This reference level will differ from lake to lake, as you'll see on the coming graphics. Um, on the left axis, you'll see we have an access in feet. So over here, you can see that the, the feet axis, and then there's a meters axis here on the right. Each of these lines that goes from the zero line represents about two inches. So from this reference level, this line would be plus two inches, plus four, plus six, plus eight, plus 10, until you get to plus 12 inches, which is represented by plus one foot. So that's how you would estimate a water level based on this graphic. You'd use this reference level and you'd add or subtract accordingly based on where the where this line is, where what the actual water level is. And the actual water levels are represented by this red line. So these are the monthly mean water levels um, that are plotted between June of 2018, with beginning here, all the way through May of 2020. This blue dash line that you see, that's the long-term average monthly water levels for each month uh, shown over the full span of time. So the next thing is the forecast. So the forecast extends from this May point. So this May monthly mean water level. You can see there's a green dash line that extends and that's represented as the most probable. Uh, so that's where we where we expect water levels to be over the coming months, over the next six months. These red lines that extend um, around that green line are represent a 90% probability range in water levels, assuming that a, a range of water level uh, or meteorological conditions occur. So if, for example, we saw drier conditions than what was expected, then the water level would likely fall closer to the bottom part of this band. If we had wetter conditions than what was expected, we would have we would see water levels toward the upper part of this band. So that's you know kind of sum summarizes what all these lines represent. The, these lines here at the top and the bottom, these dashes, those represent the record highs and lows in the years that they occurred. So what I've done on this graphic is I've highlighted here these records that were seen in 2019, as we talked about earlier. On Lake Superior, those water level records were set between May and September of last year. Now we've also had records so far in 2020, which you can see that I've denoted by these purple arrows here on the graphic. You can see in March, water levels here fell below record highs and have been below record highs since. Uh, the May 2020 level was about five inches below this May 2019 level, which was a record high uh, that was set last year. Um, we are still in the period of seasonal rise on Lake Superior. Currently, the forecast is projecting that water levels should peak about August uh, in lake, in the lake, for the Lake Superior. Um, and we're forecasting that water levels will be about three to seven inches below record highs over the next six months. So um, we are forecasting below record highs, but still above average, and water levels will still continue to be fairly high. Now, if we look at, this is a similar graphic for Lake Michigan Huron, so I'm not gonna go over again um, how to interpret it. I'll just start by saying that you can see uh, that over this 2019 period, you can see that water levels on Lake Michigan here on came very close to setting records in 2019. You can see it here in June and July, and you can see it in December as well. What you know, what stands out to me on this graphic is the lack of seasonal decline on Lake Michigan here on. 
it declined about half of what it typically does on an average year. Um, and that's really what has led us to these record highs so far in 2020. Um, so we've seen record highs January through May of 2020. Um, and our current forecast does ind indicate a continuation of record highs through about September uh, until uh, water levels then are expected to fall below the record highs of October and November. Uh, it is still in its period of seasonal rise and forecasted to reach its peak in July. Um, and we, you know, we'll, we'll continue to monitor and see what happens on this lake as um, it is forecasted you know, to peak above, above last year as it is tracking as the May 2020 level was eight inches above uh, the May 2019 level. Uh, moving on to Lake St. Clair. Uh, you can see again that just like Lake Superior, Lake St. Clair set those records between May and September of 2019. Um, and then so far has set records in January, which was just below its record in February, and then continued to set records March, April, and May um, of this year. Um, it is still about in its period of seasonal rise. It's expected to reach its peak here in June, so probably within the month. Uh, we'll see water levels begin to shift likely toward um, a seasonal decline. Um, the May 2020 level was four inches above the May 2019 level, um, and that was a record high. Uh, and we are forecasting to be close to records here um, in June, um, and only about one to two inches below records from July through September before dropping about seven to nine inches below in October and November. Lake Erie is a similar story to Lake Ontario. Um, you can see again the records from 2019, May through September. We have set records here these last four months, February, March, April, and May. Um, also like Lake St. Clair, likely reaching its peak here now in June. Um, and it is forecast to be below these records set last year through September by about two to four inches uh, before being about nine inches below record highs in October and November. And then last but not least, Lake Ontario. Um, you can see the, the records that were set last year in 2019 in June and July. You can see that um, due to some of the drier conditions that have uh, been in the Lake Ontario basin, um, and the maximized outflows that have occurred, uh, it hasn't really been that close to records so far in 2020. Um, in, in the May 2020 level was about 13 inches below the May 2019 level. And you can see that although we're forecasting, you know, water levels to be below records, they are still forecasted to be above average, which is above this blue line. Um, so still seeing uh, fairly high water levels here on Lake Ontario as well. Um, one last thing I want to just talk about is a product uh, that we have on our webpage. Again, I've included the link there at the bottom called our Water Level Outlook Tool. And um, what this Water Level Outlook Tool does is it allows us to look out 12 months um, instead of that six month forecast. It allows us to look out 12 months. And uh, we don't call it a forecast because it's really a scenario based. Leave the meeting. Um, so just to just to discuss um, this a little bit um, uh, more, I've highlighted just one of the lakes. Uh, so this is Lake Michigan Huron. And I'm going to kind of walk you again through kind of what you're looking at as far as the diagram goes. Very similar to the graphics we just went over, but this black dotted line is the long-term average monthly water levels again. The solid black line is the monthly mean levels that have actually occurred uh, over the last um, two years. Um, you, again, you can see that lack of seasonal decline and the rise we've seen so far this year. Um, these dashes again represent the record high and low. And then what you'll see is, you'll see this orange shaded area, that represents a six month forecast, which we just talked about. And then you see this gray band, this large gray band. 
And this is really what gives you that range of possible outcomes of water levels. So how do we determine this? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the, the parameters that we track at the core is net basin supply. Um, and net basin supply data we have going back to 1900. Um, and so what we do is we say, okay, given the water level that we're at now, if we uh, give you know our regulation and routing model the sequences of net basin supply we've seen since 1900, what is the potential water levels that we could see over the next 12 months? And that's what's shown by this gray band. So it is quite large uh, due to the fact that you know we have you know oh, about 120 years worth of net basin supply data. Um, and so you can see that on Lake Michigan Huron, even if we experience very dry conditions in our that have occurred in history, we still will see water levels above average. Um, it's, it would take pers very persistent dry conditions, probably more than just one year, um, to get water levels, you know, closer to this average mark. Uh, you can see though, if we do experience very wet conditions water levels will be uh, well above the record highs uh, that, we, that we've seen. So then every three months, uh, we, we, could, we produce a new scenario, uh, and those are the colored lines that you're seeing. So we'll call out specific years um, in, in this period of record to, to show a certain scenario. And this allows us, uh, we use questions that we get from public or the media to help produce these scenarios. Uh, the current scenario now is uh, two years that also had very low ice cover. Um, you know, this past winter we had very low ice cover. Uh, so we looked at two other years in our in our recent uh, period that also had low ice cover and what happened in those respective years. Uh, so that's what those blue and red lines represent, or blue and purple, excuse me, lines represent. Um, and so I just wanted to make people aware of this product. There, there, you can get much more detail on our webpage, but I thought I would briefly go over this uh, because it seems like people are, can, are tend to be interested in more longer range outlooks for water levels. Uh, so I'll just conclude with some key points here. Um, the water level fluctuations are primarily driven by weather and hydrologic conditions. Uh, water levels in 2020 have continued to be near or above record high levels on all of the lakes, really except Lake Ontario. Uh, regulation of outflows uh, through the St. Mary's and St. Lawrence rivers cannot prevent extreme high or low water levels, nor can they fully control water levels. And lastly, impacts of high water are expected to be felt throughout 2020. This is just a, a slide with some resources um, that you can access. You can get to the water level forecasts, um, those daily lake-wide water levels that I talked about in the presentation, historical data you could get at this link. Uh, any other type of basin conditions like net basin supply, uh, precipitation, evaporation, runoff, all those variables uh, can be found under our basin conditions link. Also, here's a link for a document called Living on the Coast. This is a great uh, product for people who own shoreline property um, and are wondering how best to protect their shoreline. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is my last slide, I promise um, that we have a Great Lakes High Water web page that we have, uh, that we now have on our on our website, and um, this has some great information on it. Uh, it has frequently asked questions, has a bunch of helpful resources here, and also contact information to the other offices that uh, may you know that you may need to help answer your questions. This is my contact information here below, Deanna Apps. This is my phone number and email, uh, and this is also my supervisor, John Alice. Um, his contact information as well if you have any questions regarding um, water level uh, regarding water levels and, and the lake. So uh, with that, I, I, that is uh, the conclusion of my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions. Okay, thank you very much, Deanna. Um, I want to point out one more time to our um, participants, there is a chat feature up there if you haven't found it. 
just click on that little uh, bubble there and type in your questions and then we can get those in front of Deanna to get your answers. And meanwhile, I wanted to highlight the current status of our visitor centers in Duluth and in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Um, currently in Duluth, they are announcing vessel arrivals and departures when staff is on site. There is a cell phone tour available outdoors and they're offering guest services beginning in July. July 1st is their target date to start having a park ranger outside available to share the boat schedule and answer visitor questions. In the, at the Sioux Locks Visitor Center, we have exhibits installed outside in the park. We are announcing vessel arrivals at the locks over the public address system. And we just on Monday began offering outdoor guest services. Um, which is what you see in the photograph on the left. Uh, we have a, a little booth set up under the porch on the facing the Sioux Locks, and we have an attendant there to answer questions and make brochures available. Uh, our visitor centers will remain closed until we can comply with state and federal guidance and when local health conditions permit. So I would recommend that you keep watching our social media pages and our websites to see updates about that. And uh, we did have a couple questions come in for Deanna. Um, one is someone was asking about the rock cut level. They wanted to know what the rock cut level is and what the big ships are loading to. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, luckily, uh, I know a little bit about the rock cut. <laughs> And the normal project depth at datum, which as I understand it is a five-year average of, of water levels, is 28.5 feet. Now because we've been at high water levels, uh, last summer we had a record setting uh, cargo go through the locks and I believe that that draft was just over 30 feet. So that boat was loaded I believe 30 feet 4 inches. Um, and we had another question come in. Uh, when the, if all the gates at the Sioux were open fully, I presume they mean the compensating gates and the compensating works, how long would it take on average to lower the lake level just one inch? So how long would it take to lower Lake Superior one inch with all the gates open? Um, you know, my area of expert expertise is not in, um, the regular, you know, the superior regulation. So I'm not sure, but I mean, to, to the lake level in a, in a given month can, can rise or fall. I mean, just, just last, just last month, for example, uh, Lake Superior, you know, rose one inch. So to just to lower, you know, you know, we do see these, you know, one, one inch, two inch, three inch changes from month to month. So I, you know, I'm not sure how long that would take, but, you know, to me, it, it would seem, you know, likely to be, you know, fairly quickly, you know, for one inch. And then I had a question and uh, my apologies if I missed it. I'm just curious. It seems like a few years ago we had record low water levels or else yeah. extremely low. And I'm wondering what the lowest levels are or have been. Yeah. So we did, um, we did have a period of, of record low water levels. Um, on Lake Michigan Huron, the the record the record low for that lake occurred in January of 2013, and that was about let's see that was at 576.02 feet. Uh, and then I'll give you a last month the May monthly mean for Lake Michigan Huron was 581.96 feet. So you're talking um, almost a range of about six feet. Uh, that has occurred between January 2013 and, you know, the May, this May 2020 level. And we've had another question come in. Can you clarify the difference between the terms basin and watershed when referring to the Great Lakes water flows? Um, yeah, so typically when, uh, this is, I mean, and I don't know, this is the way I, I interpret it is when, uh, I, I'm thinking the the basin. I'm thinking you know the Great Lakes Basin as, as a whole. Everything 
um, you know, that is in really encompassing in, you know, that like in, like I showed in that graphic, like that that green that green area, all of that basin, and then. Um, you know, what I think more of a watershed, I think of something much on, uh, on a more smaller scale, either, um, you know, uh, you know, a watershed of, um, you know, a river basin or, or something that's that's much smaller in scale. That's the way I interpret it in my head, but I don't know if that's correct. <laughs> okay. Um, and then again, an another compensating works question. <laughs> They're determined to stump you, Deanna. Um, is it correct that the compensating gates, open or closed, have virtually no impact on water levels? They are related to fisheries and environmental concerns. Uh, yeah, so I guess I should have invited my spirit regulator to the to the call, but um, yeah, I can I could speak to that a little bit. And um, essentially, the the outflow regulation or plans, you know, are really in, in place to help manage uh, varying interests. So hydropower, navigation, uh, ecosystems um, that are all, uh, you know, you know, what, so what is that, you know, those are all things that are going into the plan. And these plans are studied, you know, there's a lot of studying that goes into, you know, the, into these, um, into these plans to, to make the, the best, you know, result. And so, um, the outflows can only really do so do so much. Oh, the main driver of water levels is that really that net basin supply or water supply that we're receiving from precipitation, runoff, and evaporation. That's going to be have much greater impact than what can be done from an outflow regulation standpoint. And we had a, another question here: um, Can the Great Lakes states use more water to be able to control the water levels? Use it for crops, share water with non Great Lakes states, etc. Yes, yeah, so there is um, a Great Lakes uh, compact in place um, between uh, the US and Canada that just really does not allow water to be diverted out of the basin. Um, and so, and also the amount that the amount of water that could probably, for even if it could be taken out, for example, wouldn't would be so would have a minimal impact on water levels there's um you know there's over six quadrillion gallons of water in the great lake system and so when you think about it from how much water is really in the system versus maybe how much more we could use um it's just is very is very small when you put it in the big picture i think we had a exhibit in the visitor center that said something like if the Great Lakes where the water was spread over the entire continental United States, it would be, I think it was like six to nine feet deep. So I mean, that's a, that's a lot of water to put on crops. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had a question here. Um, I'm curious about the kayak paddle in campsites on the water trail and how the higher water levels have affected them. Um, I'm not in, you know, for that, for a range uh, specifically, I'm, I'm not sure, but we have seen it on several inland streams, inland lakes, um, that they are also very high right now. Uh, and there have been, you know, local impacts as well along uh, many, um, you know, inland uh, waterways and that are impacting trails and things like that. So um, I don't know specifically, but it, it's definitely an impact that's really been seen across the basin. Okay, um, in the chat, I have just posted the link to um, Great Lakes information on our webpage in case people want to grab that link from the chat um, and not have to try to write down the, the web address from the presentation. And we've had another question come in. When a thousand footer goes down the St. Mary's River, it pushes water ahead of it. How high might those bow waves get and or how much does it impact water levels right at the shoreline? Um, so again, uh, here, you know, th there were definitely, as the ship moves through, there would definitely be some, some localized impact to, to water, to the water levels there. Um, but, you know, really at, like at the core, we're in, you know, we're really looking for a, a water level that's, you know, averaged, oh, you know, we use a network of gauges that around the lakes. So we're, 
we're averaging out a lot of those impacts that may be seen at a specific location or um, at a specific place along the shore. So, you know, granted, you know, when you're looking at this water level data for each of the lakes, you know, at a daily or a monthly time scale, remember at a specific location, you could be seeing much larger variability than the water level that is being that you know we would report out on our forecasts or our 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 daily web reports. So you you know you know I you, the best thing is that you know NOAA does have water level gauges throughout the system. So if you're curious more about a specific location, I would try to find like a NOAA gauge or a water level gauge that's near the site that you're looking at to understand what the water levels are in that specific area. And uh, we actually just now had a gauge question come in. Is there one best water level gauge to look at for average? So um, I guess the, the best to me would be to look at the water level gauge that is closest to, you know, either the area you're living or the area you're, you're, you're interested in uh, to determine, um, you know, an average. Again, we're you know, we're doing lake-wide averages. So we're trying to give an average water level for each of the lakes. And that's why we use multiple gauges uh, to compute those water levels. Um, so I guess the best water level gauge would, would, to me, would be the one that is more directly related to the location that you're at. And we had another one come in. Are we able to divert water to rivers like the Mississippi River or any other rivers to control water levels? Um, so, as I mentioned before, you know, there is that Great Lakes Compact that um, does not allow water to be diverted out of the basin. Now, there is the Chicago diversion that goes out of Lake Michigan um, that eventually ends up into the Mississippi uh, River, River Basin um, and through into the Mississippi River. Um, so, there is that diversion there. It is very, it is very small. It has a very minor impact on the overall, uh, you know, water levels and and thing in for Lake Michigan. Um, it's a very, it's a very small diversion um, that was is set by a Supreme Court decree. Um, so there is a little bit of water that get does get diverted, um, but besides that, um, you know, really not diverting water out of the basin. And again, uh, would you say that there's a global water impact that impacts um, the Great Lakes like global warming? Yeah, that's a great question. We get uh, climate change, global warming. That question tends to come up uh, quite a bit. And uh, we, what we do know is we, we know that the recent climate, you know, the, the very wet conditions we've seen over the last couple years has, you know, led to the, these uh, high water conditions that we've seen. Um, but a really attributing uh, water level change to climate change can be a more challenging picture um, because there's a lot of meteorological variables. There's a lot of things at play that impact water levels. Um, you know, for example, we have air temperature, surface water temperature. We have that precipitation, evaporation, runoff, ice cover. All of these things, you know, play a role on water levels, and to really understand, you know, how water levels will change over time, we have to understand how all those variables are going to change over time and at different times of year. And so it makes understanding, uh, you know, future water levels based on uh, climate forecasts or things like that very difficult because there's so many factors at play. Okay, and we had a question about seiches. Um, how does seiche impact lake-wide water levels? Yeah, seiches do have a, a large impact on water levels, especially now because, uh, you know, with higher water levels, um, you know, you can see such an impact, uh, a higher impact, especially uh, with depending on the way the wind's blowing in that area. So a seiche is really, uh, I, I always typically use the example on Lake Erie. So Lake Erie, um, for example, is mainly oriented east to west, you know, for the most part, we'll say. If you have, let's say, a um a westerly a westerly wind so it's you know coming you might start to see water now get pushed up on the buffalo side of the lake on the eastern shoreline because we have that wind coming out of the west and it's pushing up the lake water on the buffalo but in toledo the water level will likely be sinking 
uh, because that water is getting pushed. So it's, it does have an impact. And again, that's why we take those daily lake-wide average water levels because we're trying to average out what that impact is uh, via, like, you know, via wind. Um, so it does have an impact, and especially with the high water, when we you'll notice now that the National Weather Service has issued um, quite a few lakeshore flood advisories and warnings in the last year or two, because when a wind direction sets up and it's persistent or it's gusting at 20 plus miles an hour, we start to see shoreline impacts because water levels are so high and that wind is then pushing that water higher on shore. Well, it looks like so far you've answered all the questions. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to uh, go ahead and start concluding here. Um, this page has all of our various links and one important thing I'm going to paste into our chat feature is we do have an online survey. It's just a few questions. You can complete it within five minutes and it does help us for planning these programs and um, other programs at our sites. And uh, if you can just copy and paste or click on that link and fill out that survey, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, once again, next week's program, is going to be about building the new lock at the Sioux. We're going to have one of the team members of the new lock project come in and give us an update of what's currently going on and what uh, parts of the project are on the horizon. And meanwhile, thank you everyone for participating and we hope you'll join us again. We have a lot of really interesting programs still to come. And thank you, Deanna. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to next week. <laughs>